Good morning. Welcome to another episode of Heartful Conversations podcast. I'm so honored to have Lila Vasilescu and Maris Luca and myself, Richard, uh, today. And our topic for the day is letting go of the habitual mind. So, guys, what do we mean when we say mind? So, so our audience can kind of understand, I mean, the habitual mind. How do we define that? Well, how would you define it, Richard? You go first. Oh, wow. Habitual mind. You put me on the spot, Leela. Um, I think sometimes we're in autopilot in the sense that we go our day, we wake up in the morning. I woke up this morning, I took a shower, I got dressed, I got in the car, went to work. And I think in so many ways, we're in this autopilot where I'm in the shower and my mind is rambling on about it's having this dialogue, it's having this narrative, you know, oh, I got to do this today and oh, I got to do that today. And and then you get in your car and you're driving and before you know it, you arrive at, at work and you don't know how you got there, you know, because I think we're lost in mind, we're lost in thought. So when I think of mind, I think for me personally, it's just this, this mind that is producing lots of thoughts. And it's a commentary. It's a constant commentary. And there's beautiful commentary and there's negative commentary sometimes. And it's just, it's rambling on. And um, I think for me, going on an, a, a sort of an internal search for relieving some of my own anxieties and stresses and worries that I had uh, early on in my life, um, it had a lot to do with this narrative in my mind. Because I think a lot of us, myself especially, I had a hard time early on slowing down that mind. Uh, you know, you stay up all night and especially when things don't go the way you want them to go or unpredictability comes up like COVID <laughs> and your mind starts, you know, obsessing and it gets exhausted and it gets anxious and it gets stressed. And so... Yeah, that's how I would define mind. And then um, it can also go joyful and happy. And, you know, um, I was recently uh, listening to another podcast and um, this amazing um, guy that I really love, Michael Singer, was saying how, you know, when things do go right, um, even if, for example, you get a, a phone call from your boss saying you've been fired, if in that particular moment you're, you know, in love, let's say, right, and you have um, everything is just so beautiful, no matter what happens uh, outside, you're still connected to that sort of joy and those happy thoughts. And no matter what type of news or not all type of news, but you know what I mean, um, you stay with those happy thoughts. And the way he was sort of um, explaining this was that we have this internal world that's so related to the external world, right? And we always relate to what's happening outside. But most of the times, what we really care about is this internal world. Um, just that for me, for many years, this internal world was mostly the mind. Like I thought that whatever I think, whatever pops in my head, whatever, like you call it, you know, this dialogue in our head, you know, uh, it's who I am. You know, if I have these thoughts, this is who I am. Uh, and um, it was um, pretty much what I saw around me as well. So um, everybody, you know, if I have these types of thoughts, this is who I am. And so for me, the mind has to do a lot with this accumulation of experiences in your life, what you've gone through. And they're kind of like those experiences stick to your had, so to speak, you know, you have this idea about this and you have this belief about that and they are there and they're solid. And if somebody tries to uh, change them, you don't really like it. And that's where I started becoming a bit curious about the mind because I realized that, well, uh, why is it that every time, you know, somebody questions or challenges my own point of view or belief, I don't really like it. And the fact that I could uh, observe these thoughts in my head of, oh my God, I really don't like this. And why is this guy saying that? And why is, you know, the fact that I could observe that chatter in my mind. Uh, and as I later on read and understood better is like, if I can observe those thoughts, then it must mean that I'm not those thoughts, right? I'm not my mind, but I can observe my mind. And, you but know, Lila, who's observing who? 
when we talk about mind, who's <laughs> who observing you, who? You because tell it, me, it, it becomes really complicated here. Oh man, it sounds like a psychedelic trip, man. We're going, <laughs> we're going far out here. What are you on, Marius? <laughs> I know, it sounds like we're smoking something. It's, it's a very intricate topic and psychology. This is how philosophy started. Uh, people trying to uh, give sense to what's it's going on inside because we have this amazing ability to perceive. We have this amazing ability to organize information. And I like the definition of, Dan, uh, of Daniel Siegel, who's a neuroscientist. And he said it's, in his opinion, from his understanding, mind is um, a process of organizing the flow of information, sensation, thoughts going on inside or coming from outside. So basically, it's an organization process. It makes sense of what's going on with us. So all the more we should ask the question, who's watching who and why do we need to let go of, of uh, anything in our mind? Yeah, I mean, you know, I listen to a lot of different podcasts and sometimes I think people are just philosophizing and this subject might sound very esoteric and abstract, but for me, it comes down to real practical real tangible issues here of life in the sense that, well, okay, well, why are we blabbering on about mind? Well, I noticed in my mind, in my mind that 90, 99% of my suffering was coming from my mind. And so at the end of the day, in my twenties, I needed to escape this prison that I had created. And so when we're saying who's mind and who's watching your thoughts and everything, it's just what, what, what came very clear in my mind, in my experience and, and reading the different books and looking and searching was that it was astounding to realize that 99% of all suffering, 99% of all difficulties and t challenges come, whether it's externally or internal conflict is coming from mind. And so it's not just a philosophical journey we're taking because we want to just esoterically think about these things in, a, in an abstract way, but it's a real practical, important thing to look at the core of all, of all suffering. Now you asked me, well, you said, Leela, well, let's look at the positive side of mind. Well, nobody has a problem with the positive side of mind. This is a wonderful tool. It can, it can send people to the moon. It can, this mind can create a, the Eiffel Tower. This mind can see beautiful things. And, 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 and no, nobody minds the, the, the positive side of mind. And, and nobody would want to change that part of our mind. So it's not that mind doesn't has the, I see as an ultimate potential, unlimited potential. It can go in either direction. And so, <laughs> You can try to micromanage and fix the external things of things that are it's so um, transient and and so fickle that you can't you see that you're just playing with with quicksand. And so the ultimate place that you need to go to eventually in your life, whether in the beginning it's you're going for the Ferrari, you're going for the expensive house, you're going for the two and a half kids, you're going for love, you're going for marriage, and you reach a point in your life where you realize, you know. This is no matter how perfect I get it, it's not going to resolve this mind that I have that is obsessive sometimes and compulsive and challenging. And I need to free myself of, of mind. Not that I don't use it because some then, then I was thinking, well, what, what do I become a zombie? It, it seems very barren. And I would say that when you're in the shower and you're just blabbering on in your mind. You, you don't, you're not experiencing, you're not making love with life. You're not using all your senses in a way to just completely feel alive. I think in so many ways, being lost in thought uh, takes us away from being alive. And then, you know, we get so attached to these thoughts. And, and I think where mindfulness helped me a lot is, is sitting down not in some spiritual way of just sitting there like Buddha, but actually realizing how crazy this mind is. It just never stops blabbering. And it just talks and talks and talks about this and talks about that. And when you stay in mindfulness practice, you can actually, who are you when you're not thinking? There's just another, it's a paradigm shift and it's so freeing. And you suddenly feel in love with life. You suddenly feel freedom. You suddenly feel like you've escaped from Alcatraz prison. 
And it's like a secret, like, oh my God, why didn't anybody tell me about this? But we're so inside the matrix. Like if you've seen the movie, The Matrix, we're so in it that we don't realize we're in it. And we're so attached to our thoughts. We are so invested in them. And you realize that if it's so freeing to realize, oh, I have a thought that says something detrimental about myself, or I have a thought about, you realize if you don't put so much, so much importance on your thoughts, it's actually really liberating. Yeah, but how do you realize this is happening? Because, um, you know, for most of our lives, and I can say this on my personal journey, you, you're not aware that this is going on uh, until from, you know, the things I've experienced myself, but also from other people around me, you go through deep suffering of some sort, and then you're sort of forced to uh, look at things differently, but it's not something that we are taught, right? I mean, uh, I haven't been taught this while, while I was growing up to, you know, pay attention to what's going on in my mind and to pay attention to what's going on in my body to connect these two, you know? So it's not something we, we learn. It's something that that we hopefully at one point reach in our lives. But uh, as I've seen, it comes after a lot of suffering for many people. So how do you get to the point of the sort of awareness that this is what's going on in your head? Because what you said is true, but not a lot of people relate to that because we don't pay attention to our minds so much. Yeah, I mean, we, let's take it really, really simple. Like, let's not make this a, uh, you know, a very deep discussion. I mean, let's just be two kids. We're eight years old. We're five years old. We're in a sandbox playing with our sandbox and I'm playing with my box. You're playing with your little truck and, and we're just sitting there and very simply for just staying there, we realize as, as we're sitting there in our sandbox and there's trees around and we're just hanging around playing with our trucks and, and our sandbox, a, a, a thought of pop, pops up, you know, like I'm hungry or, I need to, or I don't, I want your truck. Your truck is bigger than, than my truck. Or I want uh, that toy that you have next door. And you just st start noticing you have these thoughts that pop up. you like, you're the sky and clouds appear of thoughts, like little bubbles of thoughts that just pop up like popcorn. So if you just kind of notice that you can do it right now, you're sitting on the couch you're in the, like I said, I was in the, in, in the shower or you're in the car, just sit there and just notice. And, and if you use the metaphor of like clouds popping up into your head, like thoughts, you're, you're, you're the sky and you're suddenly realizing these thoughts are popping up in your head. Who, what, who's listening to my voice right now on this podcast? You're sitting in your car, you're, you're sitting on your couch or you're at the office and you're hearing my voice. And, and, and there's some kind of a witnessing, there's some kind of a person listening there. What's behind your eyes listening to my voice, right? There's, there's, we call it, you can call it presence. You can call it awareness. You can call it the witness. There's many words for it. Whatever it is, is some, something is listening to this voice. That's something that's listening to this voice can also notice that it can also notice thoughts popping into your head it can also notice emotions coming up in the body. Now you don't need years of training to do this. You can, if you just sit there and you just notice, it's like a parade, you're sitting and you're watching the parade, you know, the band drive, go, you know, go by. You're not the parade, you're watching the parade. There's so many metaphors, you're sitting in the cinema and you're watching a movie and on the movie screen, you can see fire, you can see typhoons, you can see bad weather, but but you're not terrified that the, you know, the, the fire is going to burn you because you, you know it's a movie. Now, that doesn't mean we don't care. It doesn't mean we don't have emotions. It doesn't mean that action doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that we're not engaged. I mean, we are all very engaged. You know, Leela, me, myself, Marius, we're all engaged in life. We're all part of life. We're there. But, but it's so much more powerful and empowering to be able to realize that you're not a victim or you're not at the mercy of every thought that's going to pop in your head. And so much unnecessary suffering comes when I'm just driving in the car and somebody believes a thought, I suck in this world or I'm no good. 
And your whole day is screwed up because of that one little thought, that one little seed that popped in your head, in your head. You know, I mean, it's like an example of it. Like when you start not believing your thoughts, I, I love this analogy. I don't know where I heard it from, but it's like, you're sitting, you're sitting, you know, and, and sudden you're sitting in a park and a, on a bench and suddenly you say, well, you know, it's too cold outside or look at that people over there. They're, they're making a lot of noise or, oh my God, I have to do my work today. Or Johnny, you know, was really mean to me today at school and that, or so forth. You just have this narrative that pops up all these thoughts. When you start not believing your thoughts, this is what it sort of sounds like. You're sitting in the park and then suddenly it's too cold. It stops there. Johnny at the park stops there. You know, pops, thoughts pop up, but you don't entertain them. You're not, you know, so invested in them. And, and you, you realize like, oh my God, I don't have to follow this narrative. But what we do normally is you hear a thought come into your head, pop into your head, like, I'm not good enough, or I'm, I'm useless, or, oh my God, this bad thing's going to happen. And the whole day is destroyed. The whole day, you're just obsessing on that thought or worrying that, or we're suppressing it, or we're trying to somehow entertain something else, not to feel that uncomfortable feeling. We're, you know, we're running away from, from these negative things, or we're trying to heighten those thoughts that we have that are so scary or, or obsess about them. From what you were saying, Richard, I gather that uh, there's a lot of things happening there's in the mind uh, concerning thoughts. There's a lot of possibilities also uh, that are uh, offered by just sitting, watching the mind or um, uh, exploring the mind. But how does this relate to, uh, and maybe Lila can, can take it from here, how does this relate to emotions, to the body, to how we act in the world? Um, what might be the advantages of um, um, understanding the mind or even letting go of those aspects of the mind that are, are unhealthy or un, not beneficial? How does this connect with everything else? How, does, how is this not only a mental game? The million dollar question, <laughs> so to speak. Um, yes, well, for me, it's the fact that once I was aware of these thoughts popping. And as Richard mentioned, becoming aware of what a huge influence it can have throughout the day, one single negative thought, whether it's a fearful one or a worrisome one or a panic one or whatever might come up. Um, and everybody, I think, can relate to this. You can you can take, you know, a short moment right now and just think about any moment you've had such a thought, um, especially, you know, uh, during this whole long year and challenging year that immediately I could sense something going on in my body, you know, whether it was, you know, my palms sweating or my heart starting beating faster, or, you know, I would feel my stomach ache or a lot of contraction in my body. Immediately those thoughts are manifested in the body and you can uh, learn to name, you know, exactly the emotions that you're feeling in the moment. Um, if you have a practice with this. And the relation is that uh, you realize how interconnected everything is and how from that single thought that goes into that emotion and that expresses in the body, if you don't pay attention to what's going on throughout the day, you know, in, in a couple of days, you get that headache, you get that back ache, you know, that you don't know where it's coming from, but actually, through these practices, you can stay more connected with yourself and learn how, you know, fear feels this way to me. Like I know that when I'm fearful, you know, the temperature of my body drops and I start, you know, um, maybe feeling my heart be going faster or when it's more related to um, stress or anxiety, um, I feel warm. I feel, you know, in, in my chest and uh, there's all sorts of sensations that you start to learn about yourself. And the beautiful thing that happens is that you kind of start to not feel so lost, as Richard said, and you start to feel like you gain some sort of control over your life. Because for me personally, this was the main motivator. It wasn't, a, I have to admit, not a very deep suffering of some sort. There was a lot of curiosity about who I am, but also it was uh, this 
sort of a fear that if I am here, but I'm not really in charge of what's going on, if any type of emotion that can pop can just pull me, you know, in this or that direction, like this emotional roller coaster that I can't really control, you know, then how am I going to enjoy this life? And how am I really the one deciding that, you know, I want to have this experience or that one when I realize that most of the times I'm just pulled here and there and I can't really do anything about it. So a lot of my motivation was rated. I want to savor, you know, life. I want to, you know, taste it. I want to dance it. And I want to feel, you know, with all my senses, because I felt so grateful that I am in this experience, you know, even when sometimes it would get tough, but still, you know, you want to be here, you know, you have a limited time. And so when I realized this is the way to do it. So if I learn more about how I work as a system, right. As I said earlier, nobody really teaches us as we grow up, you know, you don't get the manual of how to deal with this type of emotion or the other one. So when I realized that, you know, I can track these uh, sensations in my body and I, I know that if I go that way and if I follow that thought, it can get pretty scary or I can feel this way. And so once I am aware of that, I can start looking for a solution. Like, you know, when you have a headache or a toothache, you go to the doctor, right? You, you start looking for something that could help you. Same thing with your emotions, right? You you realize what's going on and that you, I, you need some sort of help to go through that. And that is motivating enough to start to work with these tools and to realize, oh, so what happens is that when I get really upset, if I go out for a walk, it really helps me. You know, and I, I remember this um, in the beginning of um, my relationship with my uh, husband, he, whenever we get into fights, he was the one that would just, you know, he had to, to walk away. You know, he said, you know, I need to go and walk. And that used to upset me so much because I know like, we're staying here and we're dealing with this and then uh, over years you know we realized that for me the way to deal with that was to stay there because whatever I was feeling you know uncomfortable even in my body I needed the uh, his presence there to to soothe me but for him the way he could let go of that tension in his body was to move his body and uh, working with kids in the last years I realized the same thing for a lot of kids and people it's like you you built up that tension in your body and the way to release it is you need to move but how do you get to that point how do you learn that well you go through this whole journey of working with your thoughts and with your emotions and seeing the relationship i understand lila and it makes a lot of sense but uh everybody wants to be happy and it's and it's great to be able to uh, focus on happiness and joy and everything else but what if i don't want to relate to my uh, risky emotions what if i because from what i understand from you whenever I bring attention to something. I kind of amplify that. I kind of bring that forth. I kind of uh, invite even um, difficult or risky emotions, as we call them, uh, to come to the surface. But what if I don't want to get in touch with my sense of loss? What if I? Um, why would? Why, what if I rather ignore my fear of? Um, a great clouds of speech and everything else. So why would I? Why would I do this? Why would I bring? specific uh, attention to all these emotions. So for example, I would, I would rather avoid them. I would rather um, downplay them. I would rather um, ignore them. I would rather suppress them. Isn't this uh, easier than bringing them forth, looking at them, accepting them? This, this seems like a, a difficult task. What do you think, Richard? I think that's an awesome question. I mean, you, you're really laser-like in that. I love that because it just... For me, yeah, and we do it. We do it. We run away from our problems. We we don't. It's a very counterintuitive instinct. Uh, I dealt with terror and fear. It was my greatest gift, my greatest blessing, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone because it was my greatest burden in my life. But it it liberated me. The terror. I mean, terror to the point where it shakes you and it, to your core. Right. I mean, terror un. Um, uh, instinctual terror, yeah, that you couldn't understand where it's coming from. And when you have that kind of terror where you're trembling to the point where your body is just trembling, you have no inclination to go towards the fire. I mean, your instinct, your body, your mind is screaming to run the other direction. But after years and years and years of avoidance, and after years and years of realizing that 
I'm only temporary fixing a short-term resolution to my fear. I got exhausted to the point where, yes, I would find strategies to run away from it, to avoid it. And you might find some temporary relief, but at the end of the day, you realize I'm still trapped. I can't get rid of this. I just keep coming back to the same place over and over again. I'm exhausted. I can't, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, so you can avoid it and avoid it or run away from it or, and, and it's so counterintuitive to run towards the, the fire, towards the burning lava, because you, you feel like when it's, when you feel in threat, it's only natural. It's only natural when you feel in threat that you want to run away, your body's screaming and, and wanting to protect you. And you, you have every intention to, to sue that and, and run away. So it's very counterintuitive to go towards the fire. But if you realize that every time you try to avoid it, you will never find ultimate freedom. And for, for me, that terror is that I will never find resolution because there's so much vulnerability. In my view, it was fear. In, 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 in my view, there's always going to be something that's going to threaten me. My mind is always going to threaten me with something. And if I try to relieve it in one way, life is always going to present other threats, other fears. It's never going to end. You will never find resolution by saying, okay, if I do this, I'm going to be safe in life. There's going to be something that's going to come along and just completely rock your world as COVID has, had, has done to us today. So you realize very quickly that externally you won't find safety. You know, as, as I'm not a very religious person, but as Jesus said, I have no place to lay my head down. And it's a, it's a very deep quote because it's basically saying that there's no place I can feel safe in this world. And there isn't. It's, there's always these constant threats that are out there. And so you, if you try mentally to cognitively find solutions, and I'll do this and I'll do it, you realize very quickly that you, you will never be 100% safe. That life is very unpredictable. That we are vulnerable. So if we're going to get lost in years of strategizing, of years of trying to fix the external things, you realize you're going to spend a lot of years suffering and endlessly working with the puzzle that will never be fixed. It's always temporary solutions. The only solution that came to me personally, and everyone has to take their own journey. There's everyone has their own journey to take was when I realized that I don't have to fight my internal dialogue. That when these thoughts pop up, you invite them in like house guests. Hey, Mr. Fear, how you doing? Come on, have a coffee with me. Have a seat here. Instead of pushing them away, instead of running away from them, you, uh, then no matter how threatening they are, you, you, you welcome them in. You have, let them have a seat at the, at the, at the dining room table. You don't, you don't sit there and energize them. You don't sit there and focus on them. You don't sit there and obsess about them. You certainly don't try to fight them. Oh, good luck on that. If you try to fight your thoughts, you go to war with yourself. If you try to struggle and fight and strategize ways not to think what you're thinking, good luck. It's like saying, don't think of a pink elephant. What's the first thing you're gonna think of? A pink elephant, you know? So you can't go to war with your mind. You'll go to war for your whole life. Try to suppress it, that's not going to work either. They're going to pop in from the balcony. They're going to pop in from the window. So you, you, you invite them in and you offer this space. And guess what happens when you don't push them away? You don't pull on them. You don't energize them. You don't focus on them. You just watch that. And, 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 and guess what happens? Over time, if you don't energize them, they just float away like 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 clouds in the sky. You, you, you're letting them go. You're giving them space. It's so, so empowering. It's so liberating to reach that one point. And it takes a lot of suffering. Maybe it takes a lot of struggle. It takes a lot of exhaustion to reach a point where you say, I can't do this anymore. And you say, I can't listen to this mind anymore. It's, I won't find freedom there. It's so very- let's say there's, there's this way out. Okay. It looks like an uphill struggle. Um, Let's say I, I, I decide to, to pursue this path of uh, a more examined life, let's say, a more mindful or more aware um, emotional and uh, mental life. But uh, it's hard as it is. But when I have other people's emotions and problems to deal with, uh, it's, it gets even more complicated. How, 
how can I deal with other people's emotions and thoughts and sensations and uh, society in general as, as it is um, that I have on top of my own uh, difficult, risky emotions. So, Leela, how do we how do we negotiate with other people's difficult, risky emotions? How do we negotiate with their uh, habitual mind? Because it seems that um, it's not only an uphill struggle uh, to to pursue my own path, but it seems that it's almost impossible when you count the uh, the experiences of other people and um, and their presence. How do we engage with other people in this regard? Well, I would see uh, two ways of of doing that um, so that you stay sane, so to speak, because this um, uh, pro-social sort of stress that you're also mentioning when you notice other people's suffering, this is a stress factor that's pretty uh, burdening. And uh, I would say that you need to stay connected to yourself, uh, to your own process, your own well-being, your own um, thoughts and emotions. And the way to do that, as I've noticed in the last year, is to be able to reach out for help because this can feel like a very isolating process. You know, a lot of the things we've shared here, you know, you know, staying in the fire and, um, you know, don't not running away from those uh, thoughts and emotions that we feel. That's a hard thing to do, especially if you're on your own. And we need more than ever um, this community around us, you know how they say you need a village to, to raise a kid. I, I've i come to the conclusion that when we talk about well-being and self-care, many times when we tell that person, but no, take care of yourself and do this and that, uh, that in itself is, is, is a burden for that person because they can already feel very lonely and isolated in their world. This suffering and these thoughts can make you feel really away from what's real and from the joy and from what you used to, to feel like, you know, before. And so um, I say, reach out for help. I say, look for those people who uh, can be around you and ask for resources and um, at least, you know, be open and vulnerable enough to let people know that you're struggling because um, it's really not something for a lot of people to go through by themselves and surely enough at the end of the day you're on your own so to speak you're with your own thoughts but it has helped me so much and I've seen so many other people you know being close to the edge and the fact that there were these other people around them with a compassionate open you know judgment free sort of uh, attitude that you know I'm here and I see you and we're here for you it has helped enormously i think it's it's high time we moved from this you know uh personal individualistic sort of egoistic way of looking at things in general in in the world to these uh communities that we build where it's okay to talk about risky emotions it's okay to say I am not okay, and for you not to judge me. Um, and I think this whole pandemic has brought forth this sort of attitude for those who are willing to pursue it, which is a lot more healthier than being on your on your own. And like you said, Marius, not only dealing with your own stress, you know, and anxiety, but then noticing around you how many other people are, are struggling and not really knowing what to do with that either. So how about we, you know, open up to each other and you say, hey, man, this is hard for me, you know, and I see you're struggling also. Uh, I've seen really, you know, miracles happening when these sorts of things happen and we get into these smaller groups and we talk about these things. We have been brought up and I can personally say not to speak about our emotions, you know, this is something, you know, you're weak emotions when just the word in itself for, for a lot of uh, years and it still is in many ways for for different parts of society and people something that you know emotions it's something you know weak it's something I don't have to show that you know I'm a man I'm I can toughen up all, all sorts of things and not just for men for women the same and so I say this is the moment 
to just let the guard down and notice how much tension even in your body there is when you're trying to to put on that mask and pull out that face of you know I'm okay when underneath you're not you're really not and this this shift from because there's a lot of talk now about self-care and well-being and you know these uh, buzzwords and I say that yes it's true it comes down to your own inner work and motivation but we need the people around that we need that that support group I, I've been helped in my journey um, so much and I I would give this as a main resource don't sit there alone in this it can be dangerous risky emotions that are kept there you know that they don't come to surface they don't breathe they don't they're not seen but some by someone you may need specialized help you might need therapy you might need there's so many things out there now but you need to to open up and you need we need all of us even those who are you know maybe in a better place now or not to open our eyes and to look around us and to notice those small signs, you know, in the colleague at work who, you know, is not really opening up and staying shy and they look, you know, really sad most of the time looking at each other. Let's look at each other and see each other, you know, because we're not going to survive otherwise. Sorry for yeah. being a bit dramatic no, it's about beautiful. it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful because it, it, it reminds me of, of coming back down to your heart. Uh, I, I have a nephew who's struggling with anxiety and fear and so forth. And he's 21 years old. And we were talking and I was giving him strategies and we were, you know, he's very mental type of guy. And at some point it was just like, you know, it reminded me when you were talking, I was just like, and he, you know, it was just this very vulnerable moment where he says, it's hard. And it was almost like he met that very difficult emotion. Like, it's, this is hard. He wasn't trying to fix it. He wasn't. He just looked at me with such vulnerability and with such connection. And our hearts met. And I gave him a hug. And he just started crying. It was such an honest, authentic moment. And it cleared the skies. Like, his, his mind at that point was for, full of storms and raining and, and, and no clouds and so forth. And when he just said that word, it's hard, Richard. It's hard. And he just broke down crying. That was beautiful. And you could say, oh, my God, I feel so bad for him. He was crying. But actually, the, the crying and the saying, it's hard. It almost like bursted the balloon and just like relieved all this pressure. And it, he, he came down into his heart. You know, like we hold these emotions so tightly in our chest and in our stomach. And, and he just met it in such a beautiful way. And it wasn't trying to fix it. It was just, it's hard. And, and I'll never forget the look in his eyes when he looked at me and I looked at him in such an intimate place and we hugged and he started crying. It was just, it was beautiful. And then after that, from that space, there was a, a bit of a clearing. And, and I think you're right, Leela, uh, just, just recognizing and, and having somebody who can, you know, give you a hug or connect with you heart to heart and come down into your heart is, is so valuable. That's all fine and dandy, but uh, you know this seems like it's going to take a long time. And it, uh, I'm, I'm, I would, I would put myself in other people's shoes and imagine that I'm a very busy person. I have to provide for the children. You know, I have, um, I have uh, either rent or I have a mortgage on my house or um, I have one and a half jobs I have to attend. So. Uh, how do I take time to meet with communities, to go, um, to go to uh, to do all these practices? It seems very time consuming, and it. Uh, where do I find this time? When I am either at work or at home, doing dishes, helping out with the cleaning, um, I really have uh, zero time for this stuff. Okay, I uh, I understand what you're saying, or I think I, I do, but when it gets down to practice, uh, how do I fit it in my busy schedule? Would like to attempt an answer. Well, just as you said, Marius, there are all these things that you, you have to do. So how do you build up the energy and the focus uh, to do them right? 
you know, because taking care of your kids, going to work, doing the groceries, you know, cooking food, all of that, it takes a lot of your energy. And so for me, the shift was when I realized that instead of, because, you know, it's a tricky thing, even, you know, what we're doing now and talking about this, because for many people, you know, you just give this, this sort of hope and, you know, there can be a different way, but then you start thinking, oh, but I, I need to do this and then this, and it's kind of, it becomes like the next thing you need to do, like the next objective you have to reach out and, oh my God, this takes so much work and so much time and I don't have, so you get into this tricky mode and I've been there also where, um, you know, it's impossible. Yeah, it would be really lovely, yeah, really nice, but, you know, if it comes down to, you know, what I have to do each day, uh, it won't work. And so what happened was that you you go on like this, yeah, like Richard also, you, you keep going, you know, because you, you find the resources or the motivation for a while. But then if you're um, paying just a bit of attention to yourself, and it can be one day when, you know, I remember I was in the park, you know, with um, with my son and who's playing with other kids, you know, and you get that glimpse of a moment because this is what we get many times, just glimpses, you know, of this. And I had this moment where I just realized, you know, that I, for one minute, I could just be with myself and I realized just how exhausted I was and how, and how hard it was, like, you know, Richard also mentioned. And that moment of admitting to myself that this is not going to work, you know, this is too much there's something needs to be done and then realizing well I just had this one minute for myself and I realized this you know I can take it's a matter of prioritizing at that point it's where do I take these uh, even two minutes throughout the day where I can just refill my batteries just a little bit you know with whatever works for me Uh, it can be in the morning when I'm anyways doing taking a shower it can be when I have my coffee when I meet with a friend or just taking from wherever I can, whatever I can. And I think it would be really nice if we have time today to also give some of these practical, you know, um, exercises and these practices that can be used and they don't take so much out of the day, but they give you that, you know, at least some sort of connection with, with yourself. And, um, the chatter of the mind will always be there telling you, you know, this is never going to work. It's the first thing the mind does. It's used to going get to having things done a certain way. You know, you wake up in the morning, you have the breakfast, you give the kids the breakfast, you hurry up to school, you get in the car, you get in the traffic. And, you know, the moment you try to do something different, and this is all neuroscience here, uh, it's, you know, the mind gets, you know, panicked. You know, what's going on? What are you doing? This is not what, what we normally do every day. You know, don't take your time now and go take a walk or, you know, take some time. This is not what we do. You know, we need to stay focused. We need to deliver what we have to do. And so it's hard in the beginning because, because the negative bias is there and, you know, you have your neural pathways that are already there and it's hard to, to have new ways of doing things and to change habits and to change behaviors, but you can, this is the, the amazing news. It's possible. So just knowing that can be so uplifting and it, it, it takes a lot of gentleness with yourself and a lot of, um, it's not going to happen in a week or two, but I can do this every day and I can have a glimpse at it, even a small one, you know, and I'm, I'm really hoping in time, even through these podcasts, we can offer more such resources that don't take a lot of time throughout the day, but they can strengthen, you know, this, this muscle of, of being with ourselves and of allowing ourselves to be in this process, um, with a lot more compassion towards ourselves and the others. Okay, so I understand it. It sounds you're playing the nice. devil today, Marius. you I, I I need to because you know uh, in the end it's uh, it's down to what we do every day, and it's down to uh, what who we are every day. So I would I would ask Richard this time. Okay, it's what what is all this observing, allowing. Um, uh, not interacting, not judging, uh, accepting. In the end, what do I have to do to do all this? How do I how do I tackle this practically? What do I have to do to to be able to to have this process going on for me? That's a hard question. Um, I think it's a lot has to do with timing. Um, it's a leap of faith. 
in some ways. I'm, I, I know I'm not giving people too much of a, <laughs> I know people like the five steps to, but I, I, I remember my teacher and I was very frustrated at some point and saying, you know, I, I've tried this and I've tried that and it just, it's not working. And I still have this terror and I still have this fear and I've tried this methodology and I've tried these tactics and I've tried this strategy. And it's just not working. It's just not working. And, and he said to me, there will come a time, Richard, it might take one week, it might take one month, it might take one year, there will come a time and it takes faith and it takes trust and it takes grace when you will be ready to let go. When whatever your mind is threatening you with, it will no longer have an effect on you, that it will no longer take you as a hostage. So there will come a moment where all the searching you've been doing and all the running around and all the doing, a, a moment of faith, a moment of grace that you are let, you're, you're ready to let go. You're ready to realize that I, I have these thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. I have these emotions, but this is not who I truly am. This is not who I am. Where my, where my heart lies. This is not where my love lies. This is not how I want to live. This is, this is not a wise way of moving forward. And I feel it and I see it and it's everywhere in my heart, in my body, and in, in the way I act, the way I am. And, I, and uh, this is more important than anything in my life where I'm going to devote my life to this because... I have one life and I'm tired of running around and time is running out. You know, COVID, we've lost a lot of people we loved or we thought about. I mean, you see death is there lurking around the corner and, and you see that life is so temporary. So you can spend years and years and years busy and running around and not ready. But at some point, whether it's a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, there will come a time and, and it, you know, you can't force upon people. People might have to go through years of just keep on running on automatic pilot. You know, they're just not ready to stop and really examine and say, you know, I have one life. And what's the most important thing? Where am I going to set my intention on? What's the most important thing in my life? Until they're ready to ask that question, until they get exhausted enough or they suffer enough or they're, they, they reach that point where this is the most important thing, more important than anything else. It's a life and death proposition. You know, one great gift for me that I had the terror was it wasn't a little terror. It wasn't a little fear. It wasn't a little uncomfortable. It was so overwhelming that I had no choice. God forbid if I had it just a little bit because a little discomfort, you can go on for years. A little fear or a little worry, unworthiness or a little bit I'm not good enough. You could just go on for years, just comfortable, but not really comfortable. For me, it was my greatest gift that it just put me in a position where I said, I, what's the most important thing? What am I willing to devote my life to? And so there isn't a right answer this way. That doesn't mean you sit down and you just don't do anything. You know, as Leela said, you, you, you have to find a way to stop this automatic pilot and, and just stop. Because if you don't stop and take stock of your life and look at a perspective from the big picture and say, what do I want with my life? Unless you're really to dedicate and devote to what really matters in life, then, then, it, then you know, no matter how many strategies I give you, and you know, I've met so many people that you know, working with and talking to that they're not ready yet. They're not ready to fully stop and say, what's the most important thing in my life? What am I willing to devote my whole, not a commitment. I'm going to make this commitment and I'm, I, I'm going to schedule this. No, that's not good enough. Commitment is like an obligation. No, I'm going to devote my whole life to this. And it, it's very scary and it's very vulnerable. And it's, it, it, it can be very, in the beginning, it can be very unsettling. And 
just to, to say that devoting your life to this, because it might sound overwhelming for a lot of people and something really, you know, maybe hard to accomplish, it starts with the simple, most mundane thing every single day. Like today, you know, let's just all share something that can help you uh, not silence your mind because that's never going to to happen and that's not an objective to have but kind of you know you know how it feels like when you slow down a bit you know when you pause a little bit and just try to connect with something in your daily life something that you're already doing that helps you do that you know that's how you know starting to devote your life to this starts it's not something that just all of a sudden it just drops on you and you have it it's every single day with a lot of patience and a lot of of gentleness towards yourself you know it comes and it comes in those small glimpses it can be for someone you know uh, listening to a song it can be you know looking at a tree for someone else it's in those most it's to me actually to be honest with you this was the fact it sometimes it's just so simple that you're not gonna go on, on board with it because it's too simple it, it sounds like it needs to be something complicated you have to have three master's degree in it and I don't know how many diplomas and courses on it to be able to reach there but then you come back to where am I right here, right now? What are you doing right now? If you're listening, you know, are you truly listening or is your mind already making judgment on what you're hearing? If you're there, I don't know, having a coffee with someone, are you really tasting the coffee? If you're outside right now, because it looks so beautiful and it's sunny, are you really feeling, you know, the warmth of your sun on, on your face? This is a moment of pausing. It's nothing, you know, it doesn't have to be so complicated. Of course, we can make it complicated and it can take years. And I've been there, you know, having to know it definitely needs to be more than this. I have to, to read more. I have to practice more. And surely enough, you can take that road as well. And we're taking it anyways. So let's be honest, we're doing that anyways in our lives. But how about, you know, pausing for a bit today and taking three minutes in your day to date, you know, really putting your attention on something that you enjoy doing, something that makes you feel like, you know, you're alive right now, you're here and you've paused a little bit, you know, like you're just going slowly, like to use an analogy, instead of going through the city in your car, in the traffic, you know, fast, you're just deliberately going slower, just looking at the people and putting your windows down and feeling the, the wind in your face and all of that. So, uh, I would want to leave everyone with this, you know, just take it small and choose something that's really working for you. And we have a couple of minutes left. I would, I would maybe um, wrap it up with a practice, Lila, that which I know you've, uh, you're, you've prepared, but um, okay, let's say I, I do all this and I'm, I'm in a better place, but still the problems of the world are there, this inequity, discrimination, racism, pandemics you know like sometimes i feel powerless okay how should i tackle this wider bigger problems you know, i i really feel powerless in engaging with all this problem i feel like i'm, I'm not contributing contributing in any way so how should one engage with the wider world from this perspective mm -hmm. uh, i would say first of all you know like a like a like in an airplane when it, the instruction manual says put oxygen first to yourself and then to your child when the you know when there's or um your heart beats blood to itself first before it beat it, it, it pumps blood to the rest of the body so you know you have to take care of yourself first and and then from that space great change can come you know rather than I, I i feel all this anxiety and fear about the world about myself and so i'm going to go out and try to fix it but you're going in with an energy of of lack and incompleteness and i got to fix it you know and i've seen a lot of people who are you know real trailblazers about changing global warming or we got to change and fix the inequities but what they do is they get burned out and they get consumed by it and they get overwhelmed by it because it is overwhelming and not everything can be fixed, but it's from a space where, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling complete, where we're feeling open, you know, and, and I see like in the United States, you have these people who are, you know, criticizing and they're talking about global warming, but they have such an energy, aggressive energy, you, 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 they're accusing other people. How are you going to bring change when you're coming from a place of complete, you know, 
chaos within themselves and anger within themselves. You're not going to invite the other person to save the planet if you're accusing and pushing. And it doesn't mean that we don't take action. You know, it doesn't mean that we don't persevere and we try to find ways to solve problems. But it, it comes from a space where we're we're in a good we're in a good place. I, I think the best thing you can do is work on yourself, and then from there, naturally, things are going to appear of how to fix things that are dear to your heart. Whether it's global warming, whether it's working with your kids, whether it's fixing the educational system, whatever might come about. And uh, again, it's where we're going to put our time and attention. Where are we going to devote ourselves to? Because many people talk all the time about, I hate this and I don't like that. And da, 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 da. But, and they, and they, they have good intentions. But then if you look at their actions during the day, during the week, and you say, well, where do I really put my time and attention? Not what I'm saying, not what I'm complaining about. Where am I putting my time and attention? They realize that 99% of it is on other random things, not on what really matters, on what they're talking about. Everyone wants well-being. Everybody wants to feel joy in their life. Everybody wants to find their joy, find their peace. But most of the time, we're spending 99% of our time doing other stuff. And that's where reality hits and you see whether you know, you're living what you're saying is where am I putting my, if I want to bring change, where am I putting my time and attention? Where am I putting my devotion? And your time and attention should be on cultivating the joy and the well-being and the openness, whatever that might be every, for everyone, it looks different. Thank you, Lila. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to our uh, listeners. I hope you benefit. Talking about practices, we will have Marius guide us through a beautiful resourcing practice that uh, we are using in our social emotional learning trainings for educators. And I welcome everyone to take these few minutes, there are not so many, and try this amazing resourcing practice. Marius? So we are now invited to explore the resourcing practice. And uh, it will be a guided session. It will take uh, about four or five minutes. And you're invited to um, see if you can take these five or six minutes in a comfortable place, maybe uh, with less lightning or noise, background noise. I invite you to find a comfortable position, whatever works for you. It might be standing upright, it might be lying down, it might be seated. And in the first instance, just notice your uh, body making contact with uh, its surfaces around. It might be the, uh, the floor, it might be the chair, it might be the bed or the sofa, we call this grounding. It's bringing the attention to the present moment by using the objects that your body is in contact with. As uh, our nervous system is stabilized gradually, You may notice uh, your body getting more relaxed, at ease. Maybe your uh, in breath or out breath are deeper. Just getting into a sense of um, I take some time for myself. I deserve it. And as your body settles into a discomfortable position, as it lets go of uh, any tension, I invite you to bring an inner smile. Um, you may imagine it as a smile near the heart. Notice if uh, your heart smiles right now. 
it might be even a smile on your face. And I also invite you to bring to mind a resource, a personal resource. It might be an object, something that makes you feel safe and strong. It might be another person or it might be a memory or an experience that um, brought happiness and safety and joy. It can be imagined, real. It can be internal or external. Whatever these resources for you, it should uh, bring about a sense of ease, safety, feeling secure, protected, strong, happy. And I invite you to bring to mind this resource as vividly as possible with the tiniest details. And as you bring it to mind, notice your body. Notice if there is any sensations in the body, pleasant or neutral. Notice where they are located. So notice if you feel good in the body, if there's any area in the body that feels relaxed, maybe feeling warm, tender. Whatever sensations, pleasant or neutral arise, it's okay, they are welcome. If there is any unpleasant sensations in the body, I invite you to redirect attention to a place in your body that feels calm, relaxed, or safe. bringing to mind that personal resource that gives us a sense of being calm, at home in the body, safe, secure, protected, strong even, and noticing sensations in the body that feel pleasant or neutral. Allowing those sensations to take over your body, allow them to grow, allow them to spread, allow them to give you uh, energy or whatever it is that you need right now to feel at home in the body, safe, secure, protected, and strong. And as we exit the practice, I also invite you to ground your body again, feeling the contact points of your body against the chair or the sofa, or your feet on the ground, Just noticing your body making contact, solid contact with the objects around it. Maybe opening your eyes if you had them closed. Noticing the room where you are or the area that you are, maybe you're outside. 
And maybe taking a moment to give yourself a warm, kind thank you for taking the time to doing this practice. I also thank you and may it benefit you, your loved ones, and all the people that you come in contact with. Take care and be well.